Hello, my friends of sophisticated image processing. So today we're talking again about another boost tool in Baselight, so which is the boost shadows operator. And I'm happy to see some familiar names here in the live attendees list. And okay, let's directly dive into Baselight. Let's have a closer look at the boost shadows operator. Besides space grade, Boost Shadows was among the first operators that we added to Base Light back in 2017 that follows the light motif of human perception. So, what is the idea behind Boost Shadows? Let's take a look at a shot like this here. I'm going full screen for a moment. Let's imagine we are on location here and we're seeing that same scene with our own eyes. So this is what the camera captured, and there's no um, there, there's no grading here applied. I'm just processing it through with the color management for the output display. But if we were standing there and looking at the same scene with our own eyes, and if we would now have the eyes travel around all of the various parts of that concert hall, we would see more details here in the shadows because our eyes would look into these dark areas, and then subconsciously our iris would open, and then the like the bright and dark adaptation would kick in. And so we would do a brighter exposure of these dark areas. If our eye then travels to the bright areas, our iris would close and we would do darker exposures of these areas. And in our brain, a whole uh, perception of the scene will, fu will be fused together from these various, let's call it um, exposures that we took from the scene. So if we have dark, large areas, we will do brighter exposures there. So that's, that's the idea behind the tool. And let's see what it does on the shot. So I'm now just raising the boost value. And we can see, so now I'm making this a little bit larger, so we can maybe see it a little bit better. And we can see, yeah, it's it's doing basically the, the thing that I just described. We can now see deeper into the shadows, but we're not losing any kind of contrast there. So it's not looking like a flat or uh, unnaturally, um, processed, uh, all of the various image areas have a natural contrast and, but yeah, just showing more details in large dark areas. So if there's something small and dark surrounded by a bright area, we will not lift up the shadows. We will not see more details there in the shadows because the brighter surroundings, you can see now, watch the piano, you can see it's not a changing, uh, almost not at all because the brighter surroundings are permitting that. So basically what is happening under the hood is that this is a spatial tool. So it works with a radius on the image, which we can also see here with the radius parameter. And that's also why it is in the spatial submenu of the operators. So that means boost shadows cannot be baked into a 3D LUT, for example. It's not a per pixel operation. It, it treats pixels based on surrounding pixels, which cannot be baked into LUTs, for example. Okay, so that's the general idea behind the tool. And another angle to describe the tool that I use mostly for DPs is to see it as adding more fill light to the scene. So when we think about a scene and the lighting, about the key light and the fill light, for example, so the fill light is more giving us like the, the ambient lighting in the room and lowering the lighting ratio and the key light being the dominant light that gives uh, like the intensity of the highlights, then the boost shadows can, for example, simulate more fill light in a scene. So we can see more details in the shadows, but we're not affecting so much the areas that are mostly lit by the key light here, for example, the center piano. So this is another perspective on the tool. So what's the difference to other tools in Baselight? Because, um, yeah, I mean, you could ask, if we want to see more into the shadows, why don't we just use, for example, video grades lift? So let's try that. So if we raise lift, we can see, yeah, we can definitely recover lots of details here in the shadows. But what else does happen? We modify the contrast of the image tremendously and with the contrast also the saturation. So now we have a much flatter and more grayish shot here compared to our original shot. So that's um, so that's one of the side effects. So there's always a trade-off. So if we're raising the black point, we are affecting 
the whole tonal range of the image. The strongest in the black spot, it has an effect everywhere and it reduces the contrast here. We can see that clearly on the curve. Very similar effect if we go, for example, into film grade contrast and we lower contrast and then, for example, um, shift the contrast pivot more upwards. So this then basically does a similar thing to lift. And yeah, so we can recover more details in the shadows, but we're also losing the contrast on the whole image in all parts of the image. And also with that, the saturation. So uh, one technique, how I solved that, prob that task in the past. So basically the task of the boost shadows is someone tells us, can you show me more details in the shadows? So that's a typical task that we get during color grading. And so my legacy technique for that was typically here um, lowering film grade contrast. And then for example, going in to film grade shadows and pulling these ones down back to zero so that we're not getting doing the shadows too grayish and too milky. And we can see, yeah, it kind of does the job, but it always has some kind of collateral effects that are maybe not so pleasant. So here again, we can see we're losing still a global amount of contrast and saturation on the shot. And typically, whenever we do something on the curve and we add more contrast to one part of the total range, it's always a trade-off. We have to take away that contrast from the rest of the tonal range. With that technique, I'm basically taking it away globally from the rest by lowering the contrast here. Uh, making the curve more flat means I'm lowering the contrast for all of the values and then bringing back the gained range here only into the shadows. So that's um, one way of doing it. But if, yeah, if we want to do it per pixel, but as we can see, it might not be the best solution for all cases. So what if we just raise the shadows parameter here in film grade? I mean, we have a shadows tool. Let's raise the shadows. It might show us more details in the shadows. Yeah, and to some extent it does, but because here it's bending the curve upwards, it's basically flattening the curve here and flattening the curve always means lower contrast. So that means, yeah, we are lifting the shadows, but we're also lowering the contrast in the shadows. So it's not really great at bringing out the details down there. Maybe if we just raise it a little bit like that, it could work, but it's there. not maybe the ideal solution. Then if you, you watch the other tutorials, you might say, yeah, but why don't you use base grade for it? There you have the zones. Yeah, we could go into the dark zone and let's push up the dark zone. And we can see for sure, this is looking already more natural. We're not altering artificially the contrast and the saturation in the shadows. So that uh, the contrast and saturation here in the shadows are basically maintained. So if we only look at the shadow areas, that's a, that's a nice tweak. But if you really look closely now here at the midtones in these areas here, and now let's also move over here to our center of the image, to the player on the piano, we can see, oh, that guy here is losing a lot of contrast. It looks artificially flat. And that's basically also what we see here on the curve. So we are raising the curve here in the shadows, but that again means if it's a per pixel operation, there always needs to be a trade-off. There needs to be some region on the tonal range that now is flattened out. And that's here the transition phase into the zone. And so that's basically that area here. So if we're doing heavy corrections with these zones here in base grade, there might be there might be some collateral effects that some areas of the image will get more flat than we would like to. But that's just the nature of things of doing it as a per pixel operation. Okay, so now I showed a lot of the alternatives. So let's have another look at the boost shadows one more time. So here the good thing is we're not having that trade-off area. So every part of the image maintains a natural contrast because we don't have to use one curve for all the pixels in the image, but basically Boost Shadows calculates a custom curve for each pixel in the image based on the darkness of that area. So here in the dark areas, we're boosting up the shadows a lot. And here in the bright areas, we're leaving the pixels mostly untouched.
Okay, let's have another look at some more shots. So here's another darker shot and let's add a little bit of boost shadows and we can see, yeah, it's boosting up the shadows as we would expect. And we can clearly see more details here on the image. In this case, because the guy here is sitting like half in the shadows, we can see he's also boosted up and that's how the tool works. Let's go to this shot here. Let the girl go halfway down the stairs. Let's get rid of that layer two. It's not doing anything. So here in the layer one, I just did a color balance on the shot. And now let's add the boost shadows. And again, we can see it brings up the shadow details. Also here, it leaves the chandelier untouched. So it's, yeah, like adding more fill light to the whole scene. And of course, if we zoom in closely and we, if we boost up a lot, it will also boost up any kind of noise in the shadows. So it's not doing anything special regarding the noise. So if there are no details available or if there's only noise in the noise floor, then you will boost up that. But still, it's great that we can boost up so much more details here in the shadows without losing any details in the highlights and also without ending up with a, like an unnaturally, artificially looking contrast in certain tonal ranges. Let's take a look at the next shot. This is another shot from the piano scene. So here again, let's add boost shadows and boost up. And what we can see that now here, for example, the the floor is also boosted up to some extent, which then pushes it more and more into the soft roll off of the DRT. So we're losing a little bit the contrast now in the floor when we boost it up a lot. And this is now when we can take a closer look at the parameters that boost shadow provides to us. There are not so many. There's the threshold radius and the flare correction. So the threshold determines the brightness level of pixels that are considered as shadows. So 1.0 means that everything in the image is considered as shadow. So basically now if I move the boost parameter, we can see all the areas are boosted up, even the bright areas. So 1.0 means basically the, the brightest parts of the image and zero means black or the darkest parts. And that means now nothing is considered as shadows, so also nothing is boosted up. So with the threshold, so the default here is uh, 0.2, we can now decide, okay, so now if we don't want to boost up these areas here on the floor, we can lower the threshold a bit so that the floor is not affected that much anymore. And also we should never get too greedy with the tool. That's, so that's my most important advice for you about boost shadows only use it modestly. Then it can be an amazing tool, but don't get too greedy and boost up like hell um, on many shots. It's never a good idea in color grading. So now we boost it up to level of two and we can see, yeah, it does a nice effect here on the dark surroundings and everything still looks quite natural. Maybe even go to 2.5 boost. And with the threshold, we're protecting our details here on the floor. To be honest, boost and threshold are the only parameters that I ever touch or modify in boost shadows, but I will still show you the other two parameters. One is the radius and you should never animate or keyframe this during a shot because it will have very unnatural or artificially looking effects. So basically the radius is you can imagine like a like a kind of blur radius on the image and the radius of that blur is determining which areas of the image are considered as shadows so they need to be large and which areas are more highlights so if we have these small highlights here we know that they are not affecting the surrounding darker areas that much and so the radius is a fraction of the smaller image dimension. So in our case of our widescreen shot, it's the image um, height. And so a radius of 0.2 means 20% of the image height is used 
for that radius. And that's a really good default. As I said, I typically I never change that. We can go all, all the way up to 1.0. So now it's an even smoother radius on the image, but that will mean that even smaller areas that are dark will not be boosted up, etc. And with a smaller radius, we will start to see like a dark glow around edges, which is also very unnatural. And if you put the radius all the way down to zero, then basically boost shadows is like a, like a per pixel operation. So now we have again the risk of flattening out certain areas of the curve. The flare parameter is processed before the boost operation. So here we can lower the black level with the flare operation, subtracting the values in the blacks. But technically, it's the same thing as adding a base grade above on here, lowering the flare. And so that can help if you have a shot where you have the blacks not really at zero and the boost operation is raising them up, up a lot. And so you lose the contrast on the image. Then with the flare, you can recover some more modulation in the shadows. But um, typically, I never do that because typically I take care of the flare in a base grade operator somewhere, for example upstream and you can also you cannot go the opposite direction so this is something that we will see here on the next shot so here we can see we have a very dark black level when the shot comes in so when i here raise the balance for example we can see that the, the black values are basically lying some of them below linear zero so we cannot really lift them above the the black level here on our display. So we're really stretching them heavily. And the same thing is happening in boost shadows. So if I boost up the shadows here on that shot a lot, we can see, for example, that small lamp here is also boosted up to some extent because it's surrounded in a by a very dark um, area. It's not boosted up that much as other dark areas, but it's still getting some effect. And if we look at the scope, we can see really the shadows, the deepest shadows are really nailed down there. And that's because the black value here is going into the negative ranges. So we definitely need to pre-flare that shot here first before going into boost shadows. But we should do that for all of the other color managed tools either way. So that's an operation that is really essential to understand so that if you have black levels that are really going here below zero. Base grade flare is the best way of just raising the values here slightly above that level. So now we have a more healthy signal down here. And now if I go to boost shadows, we should see that it behaves also more healthy down there and we see a little bit more modulation. Okay, let's move to the next shot. So here we can do a slightly different technique. So here we can see we can see a lot of details in the shadows. There's plenty of details in the shadows. We don't want to lift the shadows much more, but the highlights are quite compressed. And so now if we lower the exposure of the shot with film grade balance until we have a nice contrast range here in the highlights, we can see now the shadows are too dark. But this is something that we can use boost shadows for. So we can, for example, lower the exposure here of the global scene until the highlights have a nice modulation, like, like so, for example. Let's, let's pull it down one and a half stops. And now after pulling down the global exposure, I'm boosting up the shadows to some extent, like so. And we have a nice net effect of a reduction of exposure with thin grade balance and then downstream a little bit of boost of boost shadows. So let's bypass all everything. So we can see before, after, before, after. So we can see that it gives us a nice result in showing nice modulation in the highlights and in the shadows. If we want to keep the shadow and midtone levels at roughly the same point as before, then for a reduction of one and a half stops into the negative range, we should go to a boost factor of three here. So then now we should see that the net effect of both operators is mostly just bringing down 
the highlights here with some kind of local tone mapping. Okay, let's move on and talk about using the tool in the opposite way. So, so far we only talked about using the tool in the intended way of boosting the shadows up and basically simulating more fill light in the scene. But also sometimes we, we run into the task that we would wish for less fill light in the scene, basically like a higher contrast ratio. If we could have darker shadows, but not losing the highlights, for example. And this is also that we can try with boost shadows. So we can move the boost parameter from one more to the lower side. So somewhere in the range of yeah, between zero and one. And then typically for these negative, uh, not really negative boosts, but let's call it negative fill effects, we then need to adjust the, the threshold level here so that we can target it basically a little bit nicer on the image. So now let's do it really strong. So what we can see is that we can get a more a simulation of a more contrasty lighting ratio on the set before, after. So we can see that the highlights stay mostly bright and the darker areas are getting darker and darker. And the nice thing about the tool is that everywhere, again, we maintain a natural contrast and saturation on the image. So no image area is looking artificially processed. So let's play here a little bit more with the threshold, but yeah, I think somewhere around here is giving us a good idea on that shot. And let's move on to the next example. So here we can try a similar thing. We add boost shadows. We move it more to the lower side. So here we can see it adds kind of like a natural vignette because these are the darker areas here surrounding the couple on the outside. And here the, the bright area is the one that is not touched that much. And so let's do it really strong for a moment to adjust the threshold. So here we can then say, okay, which areas do we want to protect? And we can get that basically natural vignette that is derived from the image content on that shot here on the shot before, after. And as a last example here on this one here, I already have a, a look layer. So here we would do the boost shadows operation upstream of the look. And so let's try that. Let's not get too greedy again. And so here now we can see yeah, the, the dark side of the image and of his face are getting darker and the side with the light is not touched that much before after. So we can really see that we're enhancing basically like the lighting direction in the shot. So we're enhancing the effect of the key light and reducing the, let's say, flatness that is introduced by the fill light on the shot. Okay, one last before after uh, on that shot. And then we move on to the last technique that I wanted to show to you today. And this is what I call a local tone mapper. So it's similar to the technique that I have already showed with the blown out highlights or with the bright highlights. And here, let's imagine we already graded and finished the master for HDR. And we really use the dynamic range of the HDR canvas to a high extent. So we, here we really have a lot of details, for example, here in the flame and in the torch thing here, and but also some dark shadow areas. So it's really a challenge to bring all of that dynamic range from the graded scene onto a low dynamic range display, for example, for a 100 nits television version or a 48 nits cinema version. So what we can do is we add a new layer and then we reduce the overall exposure. So let's say we do, um, uh, let's do maybe two stops darker exposure in general. So that now gives us a nicer definition here in the highlights. And then we counter that with a boost shadows operator downstream, but we can do it here in the same layer. And then here we would boost up for two stops lower to four. And so now what does that layer do here? So that's before, after. And so we can see it's nicely just toning down 
the bright areas of the image. So that's like a local tone mapping thing. And so this is something that you could try when you have yeah, an HDR master with a huge dynamic range and you want to map it down to a lower dynamic range. I would not go as far as these values that I used. So my more safe recommendation would be maybe lower the highlights by one stop and here boost up only to the number of two. That should also give you like an additional stop in the highlights and you're just more on the safer side. So here's a more realistic scene. So this one I really graded on an HDR display to have a nice sunny feeling on the HDR display. And we can see yeah, here the highlights are definitely now for the tone mapped version for Rec. 709, a little bit too bright and they're placed mostly here just in the roll off of the DRT in the highlights. So they're quite flat and we're not seeing many nice image details here. So let's do the same technique. So let's here lower by one stop, for example. We can see, yeah, now we have a much better rendition here in the highlights. And to counter that loss of global exposure, we can add a bit of boost shadows. Let's boost it up to two. And now the net effect looks like this before, after. So we can see we have a naturally looking image and still have a nice rendition here in the highlights and not losing anything in the shadows, which is nice. So the last thing that I want to tell you today is some warnings about what can go wrong with the tool, because this is again a spatial tool. So it uses something like, imagine it like a blur on the image. The tool doesn't like, similar to boost contrast, it doesn't like any kind of black letter boxes or pillar boxes baked into the footage. So that's really not good for the image. So try to avoid, I mean, here we can see that clip is not filling the full, full image, uh, the working format here of my HD scene, but the, the source clip has that native resolution only containing image content. So what we should always avoid for all kinds of tools is baking in black letter boxes. This should always only happen as the last stage. Another thing that can happen with boost um, shadows is when you use the boost, let's call it too greedily, with two high values and you have some very bright uh, things entering the frame in a dark shot, you might uh, see some kind of uh, flicker in uh, certain scenarios or you might see on very flat uh, homogeneous backgrounds a kind of like very soft glow or a thing around um, very dark objects. But, it should, but this should only be visible more on let's say artificially generated content like graphics or a text and not so much on real images. Therefore, never get too greedy. Um, just use it modestly and you will have, I'm pretty sure, great results with it. All right, these are my examples for today. Yeah, thanks for watching this one. So there was one question that came up in the chat during the session that is about the combination with a base grade and a boost shadows. What is a good um, order? of operations and I would say, yeah, first in base grade, I would always oh, do the, the balance and the flare first to bring the shots into a nice technical range. And then you can add the boost shadows uh, if you want. And if if you're combining it with detailed zone work in base grade, I would say that can go above and below uh, boost shadow operator. So there, I don't have like a clear preference. And there, I think there's, there's one thing that I forgot to show on the, um, in one of the shots that I can quickly go in here. Uh, one of the first shots here in the timeline, this one. So here I uh, originally, I mean, yeah, we boosted the shadows and everything got brighter, but what if you want to boost up the main protagonist? Not so much. So this, of course, we can uh, fine tune here with the threshold um, slider. So if we say, okay, we only treat uh, the lower range of color values as shadows. So now we can see, so now we're boosting up only a little bit the surround, but we keep the more moody feeling on here, the main protagonist. Yeah, so thanks for watching today and I hope I see you for the next one. Bye bye.